to 45. Uh, that's good, although there's 24 more that would like to join us and register. But uh, it is a minute after seven, so um, I'd like to welcome everyone that's here for our uh, monthly meeting. My name is Ned Grossnickel. I'm the president currently of the Aldo Leopold Audubon Society. And I want to remind you that our next meeting a month from now, actually four weeks from now on May the 19th, uh, will be a very important general meeting because at that meeting, we'll invite all of the members of ALAS to uh, vote for officers and directors for the coming year, 2021-22. And so that will be done before the May general meeting uh, program. So uh, please note that. And if you um, have any opinions, you're certainly welcome to share them before uh, we get to the vote. So please note that, and it will be in our newsletter. We'll have the complete slate of officers and directors in the May issue of our newsletter. And now I'd like to call on our vice president, Eric Anderson, to introduce tonight's speaker. Eric? Great, thank you, Ned. I appreciate that very much. Um, Tonight we have a, a rather renowned speaker uh, to uh, address actually insect decline, but to talk about insect decline in the context of something that he's a specialist in. I need to back up for a minute here. Um, if you took all the animal species in the world and put them in a brown paper bag and you reached in to pick one out, every fourth critter you pulled out of that bag would be a beetle. And of those beetles, we've only named 18%. So I used to remind my students that if they were looking for a job to have for, oh, let's say 40 years or so, become a beetle taxonomist and name beetles. <laughs> Dan Young has spent the last 40 years being exactly that, a beetle taxonomist. So what he's gonna share with us tonight is one of the many areas that he has uh, explored, but one that's of particular interest, I think, to Wisconsinite, which is uh, the fireflies, their ecology, and some of their unique adaptations. Um, interesting thing about Dan, he's been at Madison for 40 years. He came from perhaps the most renowned um, academic institution in the upper Midwest, which of course would be Michigan State University, um, which happened to be my alma mater too. I can't deny that, but <laughs> we all know good places to go. Um, I'd, I'd like to also mention that um, Dan has chiseled in the notch, of, uh, in the headboard of his bed, 57 notches for the 57 species that he's named so far. On the other side of the bed, he's got one really big notch that represents a whole genera that he named. So he truly has um, been well published and is well known in the world of beetle taxonomy. With that as an introduction, let me turn it over to Dan Young, who is currently the um, not only teaching at Madison, but he's also the curator of the insect collection there at Madison. So Dan, anxious to hear what you have to say this evening. Thank you, Eric. Um, actually, I'm the director of the collection. I don't wanna take anything away from our curator who does most of the work. Uh, so anyway, yeah, let me go ahead and see if I can't uh, figure out how to share the screen again. Yep, looks like it's coming up. I'm seeing a tiny little piece of something. Yes, I'm seeing a black box also. Oh, oh, um, oh, hang on, I'm getting there. You it, can always always, really, it always works better when you're not really doing it, right? Yeah, let me, okay. let me go out and come back in, see if that works. 
Yeah, sometimes when you're sharing your screen, it brings up like different um, pictures on your computer that you may have open that you can select. There you go. And it looks like you jumped to your second slide or so. I think I jumped to my third one. There we go. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Good evening. So I'll, I'll confess that Eric came up with the title. Uh, it was the catchy play on the word light. And so bringing insect decline to light, Wisconsin firefly ecology. But as Eric also noted, I am largely a beetle taxonomist, so I can't really start this session without spending some time talking about what it is, where we're headed with this group of insects. So there's the nice little uh, header that you guys all saw, presumably. So let me get rid of this other little ditty here. Okay. I got other extraneous things up here. All right. Just so we set the stage. Common names, or why I love to hate them. A firefly is not a fly. That would be a member of the order Diptera. It's a member of the order Coleoptera, as we're looking over here at the overall tree of insect life, which is one of our logos for our department. A firefly is also not a fire-colored beetle, which actually is my primary specialty. Uh, this is the group for which I've named most of those species that Eric referred to. And as far as genera, I, I, I'm not really sure how many I've named. Um, more than Eric said, but I don't remember how many. I wasn't come prepared for that. But both of these two that you see on the screen now are, are genera that I've named. Uh, obviously, this uh, first one on the left from the Himalayan mountains and Phyllocladus is from the Indochina area. So this is a, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see an overall not very well-resolved phylogeny of some of the groups of beetles closely related to what it is that I work on. But in fact, a firefly is a member of the beetle family Lampyridae, and you get lamp out of that, which is in reference to light. And you can see that little group highlighted right here on the left-hand side of your screen. But let me point out, because a lot of people wouldn't necessarily think of it, fireflies are also very close related to click beetles, which is the family Elateridae. I suspect a lot of you have heard of click beetles. They don't look or act too much like most of the click beetles, although there are some click beetles that actually do bioluminesce like we're used to thinking of in the fireflies. In fact, some of the click beetles are actually brighter in terms of their luminescence than most of the fireflies. In fact, in the ancient literature, uh, there's, a, there's a passage where a, where a good old old timer from, uh, that was working in Brazil was actually in his tent using the light of a click beetle to write his notes from the day. Some of you may have heard of the fire of the glowworms as well. Uh, looking down the left-hand side of the table there, you'll see the family Fengodidae. Uh, these are the glowworms. And the image that you see at the bottom of the screen is a larva, probably a larva of a glowworm. I say probably because in this unusual group, the adult females uh, retain most of the characteristic, uh, characteristics of larvae, so sometimes it's hard to tell the two apart. Okay, on to the overall overview of the Lampyrids for Wisconsin. Before we get into ecology, we need to know who our players are. So right now I've been able to tally 20 species, uh, but that's a number that's in a bit of flex, and we'll find out why in a couple of moments here. First genus is the genus Pyractomena with four species that have been recorded from the state of Wisconsin. Larvae of this particular genus are, tend to be for the most part, snail predator specialists in wet areas. Now they're not necessarily aquatic snails, but snails that you would find in riparian areas or areas that are subject to flooding uh, where the larvae are largely predators. 
In fact, I could let the cat out of the bag a little bit ahead of time and say both larval stages and adult stages of most members of the Lampyridae are going to end up being predators. Um, so when we think of fireflies, we typically think of these beetles that light up at night. And indeed, that is the case of members of the genus Pyractomena, but it is only one of three luminescent genera in Wisconsin. Uh, in the case of Pyractomena, the light that is produced is a sort of an amber flashing pattern. The generic name comes from the Greek, uh, which means to set on fire. This particular species I've highlighted, Pyractomena lucifer, you'll often see uh, pyro, which means fire, or lucifer in reference to the devil or light or something of that nature, and a lot of the names of the members of this group. In the genus Alacnia, there is only one species, but it almost certainly is a species complex. And I'm getting ahead of my story a teeny bit here, but it turns out that this is an extremely difficult group to understand taxonomically. And um, I'll leave it at that for the moment, but, but suffice to say, we will get back to one of the reasons, at least why it's such a problem. However, Elychnia, uh, in this particular handsome uh, species here noted on the left, uh, is also a group that developed as predators as larvae in moist rotten wood. Uh, I was up way up north in Northern Oneida County at the Kemp uh, Natural Resources Research Station this past weekend with a group of my advanced uh, entomology students that are taking a class on immature insects. But even amidst the warm and then snowing days of Northern Wisconsin, this species is already out as adults. So sometimes referred to as the winter firefly, but it is one of the day active non-luminescent members of the group. And of course is often active very, very early in the spring. We get two species in the genus Lucidota and larvae of Lucidota are predators of usually soft-bodied invertebrates of a variety of natures in damp, rotten wood, not terribly dissimilar from what I just described in Alacnia. Uh, a little bit later in the spring and on into early summer, this is a common one to see during the daytime again, flying or walking around on vegetation. And like Alacnia, uh, members of Lucidota are also non-luminescent. Um, day flying, day active species. So even though the name of the genus refers to shining, lucid, um, they don't luminesce. Our largest genus in the family Lampyridae is the genus Photinus with very nearly half of the species that have been recorded from the state of Wisconsin. Um, I should note down here number 12 there, Photinus cretatus, has not actually been physically recorded, confirmed from Wisconsin, but it's all around us. It almost certainly does occur here, so I've tentatively put it on our likely list. Um, as I just noted, it's the largest, in terms of diversity, a largest genus of Lampyrids in Wisconsin. Uh, this is one that I have imaged here that almost everyone is familiar with if you're out looking at fireflies in the evening. This is Photinus pyralis, and it often is characteristic uh, as sometimes referred to as the dipper or the big dipper firefly, um, because the male commonly flies very, very close to the ground early in the evening and makes with his light a sort of a J-shaped pattern as he sweeps up to the sky. A little bit later on, they fly higher and they get maybe a little bit more excited or something because their J falls apart and they just have a bunch of little flashes. But um, look for this one. It's all over the state. It's a pretty good size, really, really common, typically, species. Uh, one of our more common species within the genus Photinus. And it has that very characteristic sort of a J hook with the flashing pattern that is pretty easy to 
see and spot and characterize. One of the easiest ones to, to make a call on if you're out looking in the evening. We get two species within the genus Pyropyga. And Pyropyga decepiens is the more common of our two species. Like the two genera, Alacnia and Pyropyga, it is a, whoops, and that is Pyropyga. It is a non-luminescent day flyer. It's a fairly small species or genus, and not only in terms of number of species, but also in terms of size. Pyropyga utilizes largely pheromones, so perfumes to signal and attract mates. And we're going to see that's going to be playing back and forth as we look into the ecology a little bit more of fireflies. We always think of them as lighting up, and, and many of you probably know that that is a way of signaling and finding mates. Um, but the story is a lot more complicated and maybe a little bit more interesting than that as we look at it. And let me see if I can't drag this thing out of the way that's in my way right now. Pyro, of course, as I mentioned already, means fire. Pyga refers to the rump in Greek. So basically, it's sort of a fire butt, but it's kind of a non sequitur because, again, it's a non luminescent genus of fireflies. Within the, so all of the things that I've noted really quickly so far are in the subfamily Lampyrini, the, 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 the sort of the main subfamily of the family Lampyridae. Within the subfamily Photurini, we get the type genus Photurus, and this is our physically largest species of firefly, Photurus pennsylvanica, the only species that we get here in the state. And yes, indeed, it is correctly spelled with only one N. A lot of the original spellings of uh, beetles that end in the name Pennsylvanica actually do have one N and not two. It's commonly misspelled with two. Uh, there's a soldier beetle really, really common on goldenrod in the fall. I imagine a lot of you have seen it, yellow with black markings. Uh, Chalionathus Pennsylvanicus, and it also is commonly misspelled with two Ns, but it's Pennsylvanica with one N in the pen. Up to 15 millimeters, and again, this is physically our largest. It's kind of easy to recognize this one because if you look sort of in the basal third of the body, uh, you'll see what looks like a sort of a hump-like area. It has a bit of a humpbacked appearance, and that's a pretty characteristic sort of a look that this particular species has. I kind of think it's one of the prettier ones too. But probably my favorite is a really unusual one in the subfamily Siphonocerini, and it's the species Polyclassus bifaria. And it's this handsome beast right here. Polyclassus come from in, coming from the root words poly many and clade branches. So some of you are familiar with types of philosophy of taxonomy, one of which is cladistics, where we use branching patterns to establish relationships. And if you look at that incredibly cool antennae of this cute little beast, you can see that you can note the, the, the sort of bifurcation of the antennal branches, which is a very, very neat looking thing. This is an extremely uncommon species, and it's another one of the non-luminescent ones. Uh, this particular picture was taken by a former graduate student of mine, Jeff Gruber, and for a long time it was the only specimen that we had in our research collection here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. A couple of summers ago, when I was doing some uh, survey work up in La Crosse County, uh, lo and behold, I came across a small series of these beasties in one of my trap residues. And I think we ended up with about eight specimens from a, a, like a single or maybe two trap dates. And um, un, well, fortunately or unfortunately, but th this beast is of such interest to people that I've actually loaned our, our series out to a colleague in Montana that was doing some molecular work uh, trying to 
uh, get some additional insights into the relationships of this very nifty and kind of unusual looking firefly that doesn't have any fire. So that would have been, uh, until fairly recently, what I would have given you as our running checklist of the land period of Wisconsin, but hold the presses as we often do in insect related uh, diversity studies. Sandwiched in between Lucidota and Photinus is the genus Phausus. Uh, Phausus has been very recently discovered if you look at the bottom right there, you'll see it was first collected in June of 2020. Yes, just last year at good old Hemlock Draw, one of my favorite places up in the Baraboo Hills. Uh, definitely been recorded, but the entire genus, not, not simply the species, the entire genus was never recorded from Wisconsin. With that, then, we take our tally to eight current known genera of Lampyridae and 21 plus because we've got those species complexes again known from the state as well. To give you an idea of what we do and maybe better yet what we don't know about our fauna, the only other record that I was able to find uh, for this particular species of Phausus was a record from Texas. Um, Normally, you don't find distribu distribution patterns that would, that would be confined to Texas and Wisconsin. So lots is unusual that's going on there. Probably a matter of uh, potential. It's a small species. It's possibly that it's possible that it's been overlooked. It's possible that it has a very short flight period as adults, which could account for being missed. It's also possible, as is the case of a lot of our insect work, that it simply has not been found yet. It's simply been under surveyed for. Oh, by the way, in terms of bioluminescence, a firefly is also not a mythical fairy, although they obviously seemingly do light up. There will be no quiz here, and so you don't necessarily have to see your favorite group here, but this is one version of the overall tree of life, one of the hypotheses as to the phylogenetic relationships of all forms of life on Earth. Note, each one of the colored lines, nearly 40 in all, depicts some evolutionary lineage that has evolved directly or indirectly by associates that it has in its body, some sort of bioluminescence. Here are the green plants and algae. Sorry, no bioluminescence. Here are the fungi. Whoa, yeah, some do bioluminesce. I'm guessing a lot of you knew that, they're pretty cool. Here we are. Maybe some are more bright than others, but alas, no bioluminescence. Here are the insects. The hexapods broadly include the insects and very close, several very close related six-legged groups like springtails. Some of you may have heard of those. Not true insects, but they do have six legs. Bioluminescence has evolved in at least two different orders of insects. Coleoptera diptera would be our true insects, and at least six families. That, that's a lot of diversity for relatively thought to be independent evolutionary pathways to bioluminescence. So just a real, real quick one here. I'm no biochemist, but um, this is how it kind of works in a really, really quick nutshell. You have a protein called luciferin, oops, and you shake it together with a little bit of oxygen, which is held in the tracheal system of an insect. That's how they breathe. Uh, our good old cellular energy needs to be applied. That's adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Mix in a little enzyme, luciferase, luciferin, luciferase. And this has got a teeny little pinch, just a little pinch of magnesium ions entering this whole thing. 
shake gently and you get, among other things, an output of alas, light. And the cool, figuratively and literally, thing about light in bioluminescence is that it has to be, by its very nature, cold. About 95% of the ATP of the energy that goes into producing the light comes out as light. There's very, very little heat. When you think of a light bulb or a projector or even my computer that's got a fan running in the back, a lot of the electricity, a lot of the energy that goes into producing light gets cast off in the form of heat. That's why a lot of the things that we run that have lights have motors and fans to keep the whole thing from melting down. But in a biotic system, that can't work. Notice that the two primary components are both proteins, luciferin and luciferase. Proteins don't like heat very well, as you will well know if you hard boil an egg in the morning for breakfast. So light in a biotic system by its very nature must be cold light, biological light. Literally very cool. Well, let's take just a moment as we get closer to talking about the ecology of our fireflies. What is the original place? Where did bioluminescence first spring forth in the Lampyridae? Most people, by virtue of what they see in nature, would assume it's from the adults. That's what we see flashing during the summer. It is, in fact, not from our familiar adult fireflies, but rather the original site of bioluminescence in the family Lampyridae was and continues to be in the larval stages, in the larvae. You heard me over and over again in introducing the ecology of fireflies talk about what the larvae are doing. And the larvae of virtually all members of the fireflies, even when the adults don't bioluminesce, the larvae do bioluminesce. And you can see that sort of a yellowish green bioluminescence from the back end of this little lampyrid larva on the screen. So what was the original function of that bioluminescence? It was not for signaling for mate location as we typically think of bioluminescence in fireflies by virtue of what male and female adults are doing, but rather the original function of bioluminescence in larvae of Lampyridae was a warning signal. Nature's warning is aposomatic coloration that you see in many species. But in this case, larvae, as we saw when I introduced the group over and over and over again, are in dark situations. They're in decaying wood, they're in the leaf litter, they're in the soil, it's dark. If you are going to want to warn some other predator, another insect, uh, a little mammal, a snake, uh, of the fact that you potentially don't taste good. As an adult insect or many other groups of animals and even plants, you can use color to broadcast the fact that you're aposomatic, that you don't taste good or that you're harmful in some way. When you live in the dark, that isn't going to work. You can't pull that off, but bioluminescence does. That light glow in that decaying, rotting vegetation, decaying log lets other potential predators know, you know, you probably don't want to mess with me. You probably don't want to take a taste. I don't taste particularly good. So this is then much like the things that we're used to seeing that are, that, that, exercise evolutionary, this idea of aposomatic or warning coloration. We see it in many day active insects where they use bright, bold colors like the box elder bugs you see on the left and like a whole array of ladybird beetles, ladybugs that you see on the right. And nature's warning colors, as I'm sure you all know, are various shades of red, yellow, and orange. 
There are some states where people understand yellow and red lights to be something that you speed up for. But generally speaking, the reason that our lights are meant to warn us in red is it is nature's warning color. And we are, although we sometimes don't seem to be, a part of nature. It is the same reaction that we have to reds, oranges, and yellows that's found throughout the animal kingdom. Red, orange, yellow are indeed nature's warning colors. Anytime you see this, you're probably going to want to take some pause as to what it is that you're planning to do with those little creatures. Well, let's get back then to what signaling is all about in fireflies. So some species indeed, the ones we typically think of, do use light as a way of signaling. Signaling is used for broadcasting the fact that I'm here, I'm ready to mate, are you receptive to that? However, some other fireflies do not use light, they use pheromones. So I've mentioned already several of the genera that we get around here that don't bioluminesce. How do they communicate that readiness to find a mate? It's with pheromones, it's with nature's perfumes that are very, very species specific to attract mates for one another to find one another. So we believe that the evolutionary progression works like this. The most primitive, the basal way that fireflies communicated with one another for mate selection would have been pheromones. Because remember, the original site of bioluminescence was not in the adults, that came later. So how they got together sexually in the more primitive groups was by virtue of pheromones, and we still see that. The next step of up the evolutionary progression would be some species that use both, that use both pheromones and light to communicate that readiness to find a partner for mating. However, what we see when we go out on a nice summer evening and see those fireflies, or you're traveling down the road by the side of the road and you see all those fireflies in the ditches or in the cornfields, those species that are using almost exclusively like to communicate with one another are indeed sort of on the fringes, on the, on the epitome of the way members of the family Lampyridae communicate with one another, their readiness to mate. That photic, that light producing organ in adult fireflies is found in fairly specific places from one genus to the next, from one species to the next. A few of those are highlighted here. By the way, oftentimes when you look at fireflies, I'm sure you've seen this, the light that's produced varies from a yellow to a yellowish green to an amber to a greenish color. Many times that is going to be enhanced because where that light is produced in these photic organs, they tend to surround those areas with, how can I put this, urate crystals. Most insects utilize uric acid as a way of excreting nitrogenous wastes, just as we do. But in some of the fireflies, they sequester those uric acid salts in specialized adipose, specialized fat body cells, and those become reflector cells to reflect and enhance that light that's produced. So the next time you see those bright yellowish or yellowish green fireflies, you're basically seeing a reflection of their sequestered pee. Takes a little bit of the romance out of it, I suppose, but biologically it's pretty neat. So courtship display in adult fireflies with species recognition is flashing patterns. There are a whole bunch of them that I pulled from this slide off from the internet from a good friend of mine, Mark Branham down at the University of Florida. And note at the bottom, this is all about female choice. This is not about the males. Males don't decide. It's the females that make the decisions here. It's the males that tend to be up flying, broadcasting those various patterns. And you see the numerals there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those are different species that are producing different patterns, but it's up to the female to respond to that pattern if she's interested. And if she's not interested, that male isn't going to find a mate if that's what they're using to, to mate location. This is strictly female choice that's going on here. 
female selects the male, not the other way around. Um, again, looking at this overview of some different kinds of signaling patterns that are found throughout the phylogenetic tree of fireflies, what I've done here is to pick out some of the species and some of the genera that I could quickly uh, see on here uh, from another paper that I found that talked about this of species that are our own Wisconsin species. So you'll see the, the green little lasso around species that are our species. And within that bunch, you can see the different ways in which uh, the, the, the sound or the, the, the flashing patterns are produced. Flashing, pulse glows, intermittent glows, uh, all of those uh, associated with various kinds of behaviors. And you can see throughout the phylogenetic tree that these different patterns of flashing have evolved over and over again. Pulsed glows you can see in several different parts of the tree, for example. Flashes independently evolving in several parts of the tree from other species that didn't even have any kind of bioluminescence at all. Pretty interesting. Some of you may have heard of synchronous flashing patterns in some of the Southeast Asian fireflies which must be spectacular to see in person. These will land in trees in the evening. Early on, there'll be a few individuals and then more and more and more will aggregate. And then the entire tree will pulse. It will light and, and then be dark all at one sort of synchronous sort of pattern. So this entire set of trees that you see here is caught in, uh, in, in time where they were all flashing and then that tree will go totally dark for a few instances, and then it'll totally flash up again, uh, just like those crazy pulsating Christmas lights, which I actually don't like very well. Uh, but I would think it would be pretty cool to see in fireflies. The genus Teroptics in Southeast Asia is one of the very unusual species that does this. Uh, a kind of an interesting aside, um, as I mentioned, both immatures, both larvae and adults of fireflies are by and large predators. And there is a type of mimicry. I'm gonna spend Friday's lecture in introductory entomology talking about the wonderful concept of mimicry, much of which we know about mimicry was actually discovered by using insect models. But there's a form of mimicry called aggressive mimicry that's seen in fireflies. In this picture, you see a large female of the genus Boturus, and she is munching away on a male of a member of the genus Photinus. What happens is these male Photinus, these lovelorn Photinus, are out flying around flashing in the evening, and the females of Photurus mimic the patterns of Photinus, and these poor males, all lovelorn, are watching these flight patterns, and they're thinking they're going in for a nice happy evening of copulation, and instead they end up in the jaws of a Photurus female. So aggressive mimicry, mimicking the flash pattern of a member of a different genus in order to lure the males to their demise. You may recall that originally the title of this talk had something to do with decline of insects. I've presented to you an overview of some of the taxonomy and ecology of fireflies to give us a kind of a sense for what this group of insects is all about in our good old state of Wisconsin. But now let's spend the last few minutes talking about insect decline using fireflies as a model group as a model group of organisms. They are indeed considered to be on decline in many parts of North America, but relatively little research to this point in time has addressed some of the questions that underlie what we appear to be seeing. And by the way, we appear to be seeing this throughout all of the major groups of insects. I'm actually teaching a graduate seminar course this semester on entitled Insects in the Anthropocene, what's going on with all the different groups of insects. And each week we've had a series of readings on the topic, uh, general to very specific groups and orders of insects. 
And uh, we actually did look at a couple papers on beetles. In fact, one specifically on fireflies, which I'll share with you at the end of the talk. So what I'm gonna say with respect to fireflies is probably something you can nod your heads with respect to most any of your favorite groups of plants or animals, habitat loss. I put here parenthetically, especially wetlands. Yeah, remember those larvae, their habitats, what did I say, riparian, wet areas, wet, damp, decaying wood, wet logs. Um, wet's important. They, they feed a lot on, on insects and other invertebrates that utilize those microhabitats. We've seen a massive diminishment in our wetlands, as you all know. Here's one you might not normally think of. I think of it out my way. Eric mentioned I've been at UW-Madison for going on 40 years. Uh, I've lived in the same house for pretty much that entire length of time. I live out between Sun Prairie and Marshall, if you have some concept of where that is. When I first moved out here, on a nice summer evening when it was fairly clear, I could see the Milky Way very easily. Through the years, a few more houses have sprung up in the neighborhood, a few more farms with their good old mercury lights that everybody likes to have sitting out in the front, peppered throughout the landscape in the evening out are lights. And it's believed that light pollution, you wouldn't normally think of light pollution, Light pollution is considered to be very disruptive to firefly communication. For those species that are using flash patterns to find one another, um, light is very, very disruptive and can really make it difficult for them to find a mate in an area where there is a fair amount of light pollution. One of the reasons you typically think if you want to go out and find fireflies, you got to get out where it's fairly dark, where it's more remote. It's not that they can't live in cities, but that light pollution disrupts their ability to find mates and therefore the population is in decline. Pesticide use uh, has, has been seen throughout most of our insect declines. Uh, oftentimes, in fact, pretty almost always, pesticides are relatively nonspecific in terms of what they target. And if you're a beneficial species or you're a benign species of insect and you happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time with pesticide application, those pesticides aren't gonna discriminate between fireflies and anything else for the most part. Uh, and I put associated potential of their water pollution because again, that, that dependence on the wetlands and having very, very good clean water. It seen, I get a lot of, uh, of the signals on my email from the DNR and it seems like every day there's some other community in Wisconsin that's being asked to drink bottled water because here we are in a freaking Great Lakes state and there are many communities can't drink their own water. That's, that's pretty bad. Anyway, water pollution, probably a big problem for fireflies. Maybe we could add ourselves there. Over collecting, I hadn't thought about that one. Uh, there is a paper that I mentioned to you that my uh, graduate group read that we found, and there actually was a questionnaire that was sent out to people that responded that formed the nucleus of that paper, and they said that, yeah, that in some parts of the world, that compound luciferin, because of its ability to be involved in bioluminescence, is something that has led to a potential of overcollecting. Think back of that Southeast Asian teroptics, where you've got hundreds, if not thousands of individuals, synchronously glowing in one time and place with a big old net, you could scarf up an awful lot of fireflies at once and really diminish a population in a hurry. Invasive species, what else might be encroaching on the habits and the habitats of our fireflies? There's resource competition. There are a lot of predators out there that might be out competing or beginning to out compete larval stages of fireflies and some of our adults as well. Climate change uh, certainly affects a myriad of, of potential variables. 
I lumped here together uh, drought flooding as again, it might relate to the wetlands, higher temperatures as it might relate to the wetlands and simply developmental patterns of our larval stages and more severe storms, which could be very detrimental to flash flooding, which could swamp out populations as well as long-term droughts and all kinds of other things that come with climate change. Moreover, conservation with respect to fireflies has been very hampered. And I said, I, I noted this early on, said I'd come back to it by an inability to actually do a good assessment of our local firefly assemblage as in this is largely related to the real difficulty of this group taxonomically. As I mentioned, we have probably two species complexes. They know who they are they know how to mate with one another, but it takes a long, long trained eye to be able to separate some of these species. And in many parts of the world, taxonomy is based largely on flashing patterns more than it's based on anatomy. And it takes a lot, a lot of study of the group to figure out those changes in subtle flashing patterns. So taxonomically, the group is really, really difficult. Also, there's a very poor representation of a lot of our species in collections. Uh, in, in Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin-Madison is really the only central uh, depository of the state's fauna in terms of insects. The Milwaukee Public Museum has got a pretty good research collection of insects, although not much in the way of lampyridae of fireflies. But beyond that, there are very, very few collections. There are, there are some decent teaching collections, collections that are used associated with instruction at most of the UW system campuses. But in terms of research collections, um, Madison is just about it. And unless you have people that are really targeting particular groups of insects and building up those parts of their collection, uh, they, can, they can basically go unrecognized and unstudied and, and not worked up taxonomically so we understand the species uh, for literally generations. So those are some of the challenges and some of the problems we have, not only in examining conservation of this group, but also being able to get a grip on it by virtue of the taxonomy and the fact that we've really not done a very good job of comprehensively collecting. I noted that I would share with you a paper uh, in case you're interested. Uh, this is a paper that I had my graduate group read a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is a global perspective on firefly extinction threats where most of the things that I've introduced were brought up in that paper. The paper was, was basically the brainchild of a survey that was sent out to a lot of firefly specialists and other specialists just in insect uh, conservation biology for their thoughts on what might be going on here with these extinction threats. So I'll, I'll let you uh, peruse that if you might be interested in following up. Lastly, before I open it up for your questions, we did have a fairly timely meeting because there is a seminar that's going to be held on the 6th of May, uh, seven o'clock Eastern. So that's six our time, right? The Evolution of Bioluminescent Signals in Fireflies. And that's going to be presented by a, a dear colleague of mine, Mark Branham, as I mentioned, from the University of Florida. He is a, the reigning North American firefly expert. So he is being hosted by the Entomological Society of Washington. That's Washington as in DC, not the state of Washington but he will be the guest speaker during that meeting. And it is an open meeting as far as I understand. So the link is provided there. If you did perchance want to follow up a little bit more, if this notion of evolution of, of uh, signals might be of interest to you, that would be a great one to follow up on. I'm hoping to catch it myself as well. So with that, we come to the conclusion and hopefully I've brought a little bit of, of a perspective on the fireflies of Wisconsin, their taxonomy, the ecology, and maybe a few a glimmers, get it, glimmers, uh, with respect to the decline of this group as a sort of a 
spokes insect for lots of groups that we see generally declining in the state of Wisconsin. And before I open it up for questions, I should probably make one more sort of a plea here, or at least point something out. A lot of my colleagues that are interested in taxonomy especially have been drawn to the tropics. Who isn't? It's the very diverse area of our globe. But I would submit to you that we have such a limited knowledge of the fauna of our own state that as Eric pointed out early on, if you really wanted to make inroads into the understanding of the fauna, become a beetle taxonomist and even spend your entire career just looking at the beetles of Wisconsin. Most of the groups of Wisconsin beetles have not been surveyed, have not been studied. The 40 years that I've been here, I've been beginning to make some inroads into that, but I have only assessed and surveyed about half of the families and we have about 102 families of beetles in Wisconsin. And many of those contain multiple thousands of species and are almost impossible to get your head around in terms of biodiversity. And the unmitigated fear is that we are losing these representatives of our fauna before they ever become known to us and are studied. In fact, a colleague of mine uh, from New Mexico uh, a couple of years ago named a new species of a beetle after me, Mycterus youngi, and it was only known from a couple of specimens from Wisconsin and nowhere else on the planet. Relatively recently, when I was perusing through some collections from Eric's and my good old alma mater, Michigan State University, I found two specimens from Michigan as well, extending pretty dramatically the known range of that species. And I put a little paper together to basically pose the question, is this species rare? Is it in decline? Or is it simply that it's never been looked for and studied? So with that, I'll take a pause, wet my whistle. It's only Diet Dr. Pepper at this point in the evening and open it up for any questions that you might have. And thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Dan. This is this is wonderful. Um, and a reminder to everybody to go ahead and use that chat if you have questions. But we do have one that has come in. And I have to apologize in advance if I do not get my pr pronunciation correct. Um, but Moya has had put a question in there saying that she read about or they read about the phototaurus consuming their fireflies in order to gain Lucibe Vegas, Bengen, Begins, how am I saying that? Um, which they are missing. Is this actually true? Do they consume another firefly for the benefit of the? It, there is a thought that the, the, the Photurus and Photinus interaction that I mentioned to you, that those females that are preying on the males are getting some benefit other than simply nutrients out of that. So yeah, that has been suggested. I'm not sure whether it's just a hypothesis at this point or whether there's been demonstrable evidence for that because Photurus and Photinus are both luminescent species, right? They don't, they aren't absolutely reliant on that. But, but many insects are gonna sequester compounds that they get from, from what they feed on. For example, you mentioned the firefly interaction, but let me take it to one that I, I'm guessing that many of you are acquainted with, of course, the monarch butterfly. The monarch caterpillar feeds on what? Milkweed. Milkweed. Yeah. Many milkweeds produce a white milky latex. That's why they're called milkweeds. Not all of them do, right? One of, the most, one of the most beautiful ones that we get, Asclepius tuberosa, the butterfly weed doesn't have that milky latex. But the ones that do have the milky latex contain some very nasty compounds like cardiac glycosides. Doesn't sound like something you wanna be munching on. But the monarch caterpillars sequester those compounds from the plant into their own bodies. And they carry that all the way through to the adult stages. So the fact that a interaction between fireflies 
would enable them to bioaccumulate some precursors to the luciferin that they need to generate light would certainly be something that would be a strong possibility. Neat. I have a question. Um, just like we're using, a lot of people are starting to look at their landscape and bringing in some native plants in order to bring more biodiversity into their backyards. Is there, are there different plants that um, fireflies depend on, you know, similar to the milkweed and the, and the monarch to bring them into your um, backyard? Is there something back we can do in our backyard to benefit fireflies? And, and see more of those like, like we had when we were kids. <laughs> Keep them really wet and then you'll have horrible mosquito problems. But <laughs> yeah, remember that, that they're predators both as larvae and adults. So they're feeding on other little microscopic invertebrates like springtails and other tiny little insects and, and, and crustaceans that are in that wet landscape, that wet microhabitat. So they, I would say generally, they would not be plant dependent much at all, okay. but, and they're also generalist predators. So it's not like I could say, well, you need, to, you need to look at this particular group of plants so that they will induce this particular group of insects to be on those plants so that the fireflies have something to feed on. Because as generalist predators, uh, they aren't hunting for a particular group of insects where you could make that sort of what we refer to as a kind of a tritrophic kind of a system where you have mm. the plant, the insect that feeds on the plant, and the insect that feeds on the insect. Yeah, I guess it's too far. Um, but but, but you will notice that, and, and, and many of you undoubtedly have, have discovered this as you, you know, I, I alluded to, you know, going down the highway or a country road in the evening and seeing the massively large number of fireflies in, in, the little, um, in, in the little area between the, the, the agricultural field and the road in the, in the little the ditch. You know, ditch area. Those ditch areas are what? They're typically quite wet. So inadvertently, we, we produce a lot of good firefly habitat by virtue of those wet areas. Now, again, the counter to that is those are also tend to be areas that, that are gonna be breeding a lot of mosquitoes. So a lot of folks would say that's not a particularly wonderful trade-off. I'm sure that fireflies do consume some mosquitoes, but mosquito larvae are strictly aquatic and the firefly larvae, while they feed in wet areas, are not aquatic themselves. Well, there's one or two species that are thought to be potentially aquatic that have gills on the back end, but I still think they're largely riparian. Uh, Dr. Young, I uh, taught zoology or animal biology for many years, but I've retired now. And um, I always uh, used the coleoptera as a, uh, that was the largest number of species in the world. And I always thought, well, back in 1982, when I started teaching, it was somewhere around 375 to 400,000 species in coleoptera. I was wondering uh, about how many species are there now and how many species are added either per year or per decade to this order, this massive order? That's a wonderful question that I don't know the answer to. Um, I can tell you this. Um, I, don't, I just don't think people keep up with those massively large numbers. Uh, yeah, the, the number that you, that you mentioned is typically thrown out, the 350 to 400,000 number. But that's like you and I, that's a bit dated. Uh, but here's what I can say. We know that about the equivalent number of new species of insects, not, not just beetles, but insects in general, about the equivalent number of newly discovered, newly described and named species of insects are hitting the publication flow every year as the entire known number of mammals. Wow. There are about 4,500 newly discovered species of insects every single year, which is in a ballpark of what most people think is a fairly decent number for the number of, of, of mammal species. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're burdened with the, with the entirety of, of the mammalia every single year with new species. And, and, and it, it, would be, it would be probably 
uh, within the realm of likelihood that if you look at percentages that just take a quarter of those, so roughly a thousand of those then would be new species of beetles each year. And we are in no way near, not even near uh, the end point of those discoveries. Again, the tra tragic thing is we're going to lose an awful lot of those species before they ever even get named. Joan has asked the question, how often they mate or is it just a one shot deal to reproduce? It depends on the species. Um, a lot of the species will be out only for a relatively short light season. And again, when you're looking at your favorite ones in the backyard or wherever, you'll see them out for a fairly definitive period of time. Um, but it's, it's not, it, it, each, each species has its own little flight season. That's a portion of the spring and summer and not so much too much into the early fall. Uh, species may mate more than one time. Uh, that would be true of most species. It, it's very difficult to generalize because again, we're looking at 20 species plus here and fireflies as a general rule, there's several thousand of them. So it's hard, it's hard to, it, it would be misleading to, to generalize but definitely some of them uh, mate more than one time. I don't know of any that only mate once, but I'm not really sure that we know enough about their biology to make a, an equivocation there. Um, Lynn has asked, I've recently seen signs and flyers advertising mosquito control services for people's yards. I've read they spray a class of insecticides called, and I, I apologize again, but um, pyrethins. To, and do you think these harm fireflies? I am a taxonomist. I, am, I have no expertise in toxicology or insecticide use and application. However, they are insecticides. They are not, they are not culicicides, they aren't specific to mosquitoes. And so I would say, I hate to paint with a broad brush, but I would suggest that anything that you apply to control mosquitoes has a very, very likely potential to have a detrimental effect on a lot of other things that are in that vicinity. Um, pyrethroids would be one class. There's a really nasty group called the neonicotinoids that that a lot of people use agriculturally and and a lot of these things are, are promoted for for home use um i would be very reluctant to use them um i, I know we have problems we <laughs> we have some pretty significant problems with mosquitoes in our yard I always say that you know when when it's a when it's a nice wet winter and spring we're gonna have a horrible mosquito problem, but then our yellow jacket and paper wasp would be lower in numbers. When it's a when it's a bad year, as in the low year for mosquitoes, then we tend to have a big problem with things like yellow jackets and 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 paper wasps because they're they're opposing one another in terms of what they like for wetness and dryness, but. Yeah, I, I generally, personally, okay, this is not me representing the university or anything else, but personally, I, I don't use any chemical controls. I don't even use, I don't even use insecticides. I don't use insecticide sprays. I don't, I don't use off. Mm -hmm. I, I would rather get I'd rather get nailed by the mosquitoes than have the stuff on me. I, I don't, I have fairly sensitive skin and I, I don't react particularly well to pyrethroids. Plus you can see I'm wearing glasses. Yeah, if you wear glasses, they tend to melt the plastic in your glasses. Not sure what that's doing to our insect population if it's melting my glasses to my face. <laughs> Craig adds to this a little bit. The, regardless of the direct toxicity, endocranian disruption, disruption is a major issue with exposure to many of the chemicals. So yeah, endo endocrine, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In other words, the things that are balancing their physiology. Dan, yeah. you, you mentioned that we have 21 species of these, um, at least 21 species of fireflies in the state. If you look at the distribution of them, we, we have that 
um, vegetative tension zone that runs through central Wisconsin, kind of separating the northern boreal from the, the southern vegetation zone. I'm curious, do the distributions of those 21 species follow that same kind of distribution of vegetation in the state? Cautiously, I would say no. Um, it's more of, it really is more related to wet availability, wetness availability. What we tend to see, um, you, you all are interested in fireflies because you're from the Midwest. If we were from the Rockies on towards the West, we wouldn't even be caring much at all about fireflies because they almost don't occur out there. Uh, it, it's very much a group that we think of as a mesic group. So I have not seen any distinct patterns that relate to the tension zone, but let me go back and say that we have very, very poorly sampled the fireflies of the state of Wisconsin. And where do most of our collections come from? Dane County, which is where we're located. That's where everybody collects. Milwaukee County, Racine County, uh, maybe a little bit over where people like to vacation. We got some pretty good collections from Bayfield County. Even when you go down to the Field Museum in, in Chicago, they have some pretty good collections from far north of Wisconsin. Why? Because that's where everybody's going to vacation and they go up there and collect. So there's a lot of sampling bias that's introduced into the collections that we have. It really takes someone who's interested in a particular group to basically say, I want to go out and I want to take it upon myself to broadly sample this particular group that's small enough that I can get my head around and just do exhaustive sampling. With the group that I do specialize on that, that has the same start of the name, Pyro, Pyrocroity, um, I, I do have a pretty good sense of the distribution in the state of that group. And for that group, I don't see much in the way of any kind of relationship with tension zone. Some groups, yes. Uh, and most of the things as you might think of uh, with just with biodiversity in general, are gonna be south of the, of the tension zone. Very few things within the tension zone, tension zone restricted, and relatively fewer things that would be what we think of as more boreal and, and, and located primarily north of the tension zone. One of the genera and species that, of my particular group, Pyrocroidae, is north of the tension zone. In fact, it's a circumboreal genus with about a half a dozen species, but all of them pretty much circumboreal. You get down to our part of the state, well, they get into the Baraboo Hills, but it's largely in those areas that are very, very deep, mesic, sort of boreal-like outcroppings. Yeah. And one last thing, Dan, my apologies to you. I may have said that you named one genera. You've actually named seven of them, just to refresh your memory on that one. Thanks. <laughs> more, more work to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Coming up with new genera. And people get really impressed by, you know, by naming new genera and species. And it, it's, 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 you know, it's a good feeling. I like it. That's what I do. But um, it's, you know, it's not nearly the kudos that would come from, you know, finding a new species of bird in Wisconsin. <laughs> and, and for that matter, of, of all the new species that I named, FYI, let's see, one of them was from Wisconsin. Yeah, most, most of them are from Asia. Do you need any permits um, to collect insects? Curious as my kids like to gather insects, and I know we have to be careful of like bird feathers, even like there, you can't just save that. But what about insects? Um, are there permits or restrictions for that? You've mentioned kind of insect collection, but yeah, what, yeah, we always well, it depends on where you collect, right? If, if you if you collect on private land, generally you don't need any kind of permit other than a permission from the landholder. Uh, I have permits that I have for myself and my students that I that we seek each year from the DNR for state natural areas and from the Nature Conservancy for the Nature Conservancy holdings. So, so we always do that. Uh, generally speaking, and it's a blanket thing, but generally speaking, state parks are, are no. Okay. You, you look but don't collect. 
Uh, state and national and national forests uh, are getting to be more selective in terms of what they will allow you to do. The rule of thumb that I would say to anyone is to ask. If, if you're in an area that's that's going to be um, legislated by a particular body, always always ask. Is it okay if I collect some insects and we're just collecting these with the kids for fun? Is that okay? Generally speaking, generally speaking, they'll say, oh, you're collecting bugs? Yeah, collect all you want. They're just bugs. <laughs> okay, but, thanks. But, but I can relate a cute story. I was out in uh, Yellowstone National Park, and of course, national parks are strictly forbidden to collect in unless you have very, very substantial permitting. And I was standing there talking to one of the rangers. Uh, she knew I was interested in insects and was asking me questions. And all during our conversation, she was slapping mosquitoes on her. And I'm like, you've just, you've just committed about 13 felonies there. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> poor mosquitoes get dealt with rather differently than most insects, I guess. They sure do. Well, Dan, thank you so much for this, um, for joining us tonight, being with the group. Um, for the group, I'm just going to give you a few more reminders of things that are up and coming and are happening right now. Um, currently going on is our 30 by 60 by 90 club challenge. We are raising funds for Schmeekly Reserve to add some more solar panels, um, solar arrays to their um, site. So helping them meet their goals. We are matching $3,000 and trying to collect $3,000 from the club members. So join the club by, committed to, by um, submitting $30, $60, or $90 to this, this initiative. You can learn more on our website. Uh, we also have Junior Audubon. A lot of activity for Junior Audubon is happening in May. May 12th is the ruby-throated hummingbird drawing with birds. So Karen Sig is going to be joining us again on Zoom and walking us through drawing um, ruby-throated hummingbirds. Please join us, tell your kids, tell your grandkids. And then we are also doing bird banding in May. So bird banding for Junior Audubon, May 29th. Again, we have to follow COVID restrictions for this one. It will be in person at Schmeekly Reserve, but we have to have um, monitor how many people are coming through at a time. So please sign up on our website. We also have, and, and even the board members don't know this one yet, but we for Junior Audubon are planning a herps hike. So we have a father who is into herps, herpetology, and we are gonna go out and look for some herps on in June. I believe the date's gonna be June 19th. More details will be coming out soon on that one. Our program presentation for next month is May 19th, A Guide to Natural Events by Randy Hoffman. Please go ahead and sign up. That registration is already online and available for you to sign up. Earth Day is tomorrow. Earth Day is every day, but happy Earth Day to everyone. Have a wonderful wow. evening and thanks for joining us. I was going to point that out. Darn, forgot. <laughs> well, <it's> <laughs> I jumped to it. Got you. I got there before. And it's John Muir's birthday today, too. So, hey, oh, now I do Muir. feel honored. <laughs> yeah, big man. Great. So, thanks for coming, everyone. Dan, thanks so much for in Yeah, if anyone has any other questions down the road, feel free to forward them to me by email. You can find me pretty easy at the university. Dan, I send out a reminder in the recording to everybody after this. Would you mind sending me or Eric the link to the global perspective? You included a link in your presentation. Um, I didn't capture it beforehand. It was the paper and a, a link to the paper you had. I yeah. think it was on the second to last slide. If you yeah, send I, it, can, I can send you the paper. <laughs> yeah, I can send you the paper. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Happy to. Okay. Excellent. Wonderful, everyone. Um, we'll end there. Thank you so much. Susan, um, I need to talk.